All right, let's dig in to EdTPA task one. But first, let's pause. Take just a minute, take a deep breath, remind yourself that everything in the EdTPA is connected to skills and concepts that you are already doing in your daily planning. Just now, you're doing it for a five-day learning segment. Please also plan to listen intensely as this video is meant to be an overview of task one. We will have an additional video that goes into depth on prompt language later. This video is just meant to get you thinking about your EdTPA and choosing a focus learner and a learning goal. Please open your EdTPA handbook and have a place where you can write down your notes and ideas. Planning task one, planning for instruction and assessment. I'm sure you remember from the first video that the EdTPA handbook is organized into sections titled, what do I need to think about? what do I need to do, and what do I need to write. We will begin our overview by discussing items that we should be thinking about as we are beginning our EdTPA. First, think about a learner that you might be considering for your focus learner. Pause the video for a moment and jot down some of their strengths and skills. Next, Think about your first content area that you have begun teaching. What are the knowledge and skills that you want your focus learner to develop in the coming weeks? Consider also how you might support your focus learner through the use of instructional strategies that will support their learning and communication. Think also about how you will know if your learner is meeting the learning goal. How might you monitor their progress? Next, we're gonna think about what do I need to do for planning task one, planning for instruction and assessment. First, you will select one focus learner that has an individualized education plan or IEP. You should not change your instructional setting and will continue to teach in the context in which you normally teach. It's also important to note that before you solidify a selection as your focus learner, you need to ensure that you have permission for video recording, whether that be permission from the ISU contract that allows you to record or an individual permission form that has been sent home and signed by a parent or a guardian that allows you to record any instructional lessons. After you have identified a focus learner, it will be time for you to consider one learning goal. This learning goal will serve as the focus of your learning segment. When identifying your learning goal, you first need to ask yourself if the focus learner is working on academic content. If your focus learner is working on academic content, then the focus of your learning goal needs to be related to an academic skill. If your learner has academic learning goals on their IEP, in literacy, math, social studies, or science, try to select a learning goal that connects to one of their IEP goals or objectives. If there is no IEP goal related to the content, perhaps if your learner only has behavior goals, still select a learning goal that relates to academic content if the focus learner is working on academic skills. Next, you will begin to gather baseline data before you begin planning for your learning segment. Use this baseline data to plan and develop a five lesson learning segment that will be appropriate to your focus learner based on the knowledge and skills that they have. The baseline data should allow you to describe the focus learner's level of knowledge and skills and any planned supports that they may need. 
Remember to check the EdTPA glossary for the definition of baseline data, as their definition encompasses a variety of sources that can be used, such as curriculum-based measures, you could use pretests, you could use work samples, checklists, observational notes that you've taken, or your daily lesson learner performance data that you have been collecting from your first content area. Next, communication skill. You will identify either one expressive or one receptive communication skill that is related to your learning goal. You want to choose a communication skill that will allow your learner to participate or demonstrate learning that's related to their learning goal. If the learning goal is a communication skill, select another communication skill that is related to the learning goal. It is really important that your communication skill is a different skill than your learning goal that you are teaching. Next, you will design a five lesson learning segment. If for some reason you're unable to complete a five lesson learning segment, please reach out to your coordinator to get specific feedback on what your expectations will be. For most, a five lesson learning segment is the expectation. Your goal is to provide access to curriculum and instruction and support the focus learner in meeting the learning goal. You will write five individual instructional plans for your learning segment that you will submit in one document when you turn in your EdTPA. The criteria for these instructional plans are similar to what ISU already requires on our instructional plan format. So you will use our typical instructional plan template for your EdTPA lessons. You must have one lesson objective that has measurable criteria for the focus learner. If you're teaching group instruction, this could be a goal or objective that relates to all learners, but you want to specifically differentiate if there's any differences being made for your focus learner. You'll have an assessment tool and explain your data collection procedures, just like we do on our instructional plans. You'll include your instructional strategies as well as your learning tasks along with any modifications or accommodations that you are creating to meet the individual need of your focus learners. You'll have your communication skill along with their plan supports and you'll be thinking about generalization, maintenance, or how your learner can be self-directed and using their knowledge and skills to reach their learning goal. As you're writing your instructional plans, one thing that we need to consider is that each lesson plan can be no more than four pages in length. We'll discuss this more during our synchronous learning sessions about how you can condense those plans and eliminate any extraneous information that isn't required. The next section on our what to do list is to respond to the commentary prompts. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, we'll have another online learning segment where we really dig into the commentary prompts. But you can go ahead and start looking at the commentary prompts. They come in your EdTPA handbook right after the what do I need to write section. Additionally, you will need to submit your materials and your assessments for your learning segment. In terms of your materials, you will submit any key instructional materials or any support materials that will be helpful to understand what you're including in your instructional plan. You may have no more than five additional pages per lesson plan. So a document that you'll submit can be up to 25 pages. For your assessment materials, you are going to submit any blank copies of all written assessments as well as your data sheets and including your data collection procedures that you might be using. You might also include your daily assessment record, so looking at your overall 
learning goal and how you are going to collect data to monitor your focused learners' progress to ensure that they are making progress towards all lesson objectives. All right, our next section, what do I need to write? So you'll submit your context for learning, which we'll talk about more in depth on the next slide. You'll also need to write your instructional plans. So to summarize, you'll have five instructional plans that can be no more than four pages per plan. You'll submit those five plans in one document. And finally, you will submit your task one planning commentary. This we will discuss more in depth in a future online module. Up next, we have the context for learning. So one of the first documents that you can begin working on is the context for learning. You'll find this towards the end of your EdTPA handbook. Once you identify a focus learner, you can begin sharing some information about the environment, the setting type, district requirements, textbook, instructional programs, or composition of your instructional group. For example, are you teaching whole group to seventh grade students in math? Or are you working in small groups in an elementary reading class? Or maybe even you are working one-on-one -on -one with learners on their individualized functional needs. Additionally, you're gonna include some information that's just about your focused learner. This will provide the reader of your EdTPA with some context about your learner, including their age, their gender, what grade level they're in, the primary language that they speak, the discussion around their disability strengths and needs, communication needs, as well as behavior management. Professional responsibilities. There are several professional responsibilities that are discussed towards the end of the EdTPA handbook that are really imperative for us to understand. The first is related to confidentiality. You may use your learner's initials or first name. This includes more than just in the commentary. As you are referring to your learner in your instructional plans, materials, please also make sure that you are only including the learner's initials or first name. Even thinking forward to when you're submitting your task three, you're going to be submitting a work sample for your focus learner. Think there about blacking out or um, removing any identifying information about your focus learner. Permissions. You may need a video permission form depending on the requirements of your school district or cooperative. As you know, ISU's new contract should permit the use of video. However, some districts are still requiring that you send home permission forms that need to be signed. So please make sure that you are aware of the requirements at your site and have any necessary video permission forms before ever selecting a focus learner. Citing sources. Make sure that you're citing any materials that you did not create. There will be multiple spots where you can include this in your context for learning. They ask if you could cite any um, curriculum or textbooks that you're using. And then you also can have citations within each of the tasks if you are discussing materials that you did not create. First aid standards, make sure that you are aligning with our Illinois learning standards and making sure that you are choosing grade specific standards that align with the age of your focus learner. And finally, the EdTPA integrity statements. Under the professional responsibilities section, EdTPA has bulleted several items that they would like for you to be able to confirm that you are adhering to, such as you have the primary responsibility for teaching your focused learner, so meaning you are not seeking out another learner to teach that you typically wouldn't be responsible for teaching. You are also 
claiming that this is the first time you've taught this learning segment. You're not teaching and reteaching the same thing just to be perfect. The video clips are unedited, so they are continuous and you're not doing a highlight reel of your best work. Instead, you are submitting a continuous video clip. The focus learner's work included in the documentation is that of your focus learner, so you aren't submitting someone else's work in lieu of what your focus learner actually completed. You're also saying that you are the author of these commentaries and that all of the written responses to the prompts are from you. You also have made appropriate citations for any materials or assessments that are from text or the internet or other educators like on Teachers Pay Teachers and are not claiming that those are yours. Up next, we're going to take a look at the Ed TPA rubrics. We'll start by looking at planning rubric number one. It's important to note that during the field-based semester, we will not be utilizing the Ed TPA rubrics. However, these will be the rubrics that you are assessed on when you complete the Ed TPA for licensure during student teaching. So we wanted to make sure that we were discussing these rubrics so that you're aware of how they will be utilized when they are a licensure requirement. For each of the Ed TPA tasks, there will be five rubrics assigned. So task one has Ed TPA rubrics one through five, task two will have six through 10, and task three will have 11 through 15. When Ed TPA scorers are reviewing your Ed TPA commentaries, as a baseline, they begin to look at level three. So level three is the starting place for all submissions. The scorers will read all of the criteria within level three and make a determination. If you have met all of the criteria in level three, they will then move to a level four. If you have met all of the criteria in level four, they will then move to level five. So you'll see here in level five, it says level four plus, and then there are some additional indicators that are listed to score a five. Assuming we are at level three, and there was a piece that you happen to be missing, then the Ed TPA scorer would move to a level two, and if there were things that were missing from the level two, they would then move to a level one. So just wanting to explain to you how the Ed TPA scoring rubric works, um, just for your knowledge when you are in student teaching and you will be really reviewing these rubrics before you submit. So we'll take a look at the ISU rubric that we will be using this semester. So similarly to the Ed TPA rubric, we will start off by looking at the acceptable column. So all of the indicators that are listed in the acceptable column would be something similar to finding a level three and a level four on the Ed TPA rubric. So if you have all of the items that you need to have, you will score in the acceptable column. To score in the exemplary column, then you would need to have all of the items in a three or a four rating, and then have those that would also belong in a level five. So we ask that you start looking at that acceptable rating, and then we will go through and use each of those indicators as kind of our own checklist as we're going through and reading your Ed TPA to score to determine if you have the items that you need. If you have all of the items and they are really professionally written, we will move to the exemplary column to see if you have included those items. If you're missing one or two items, then we will move to partially acceptable. So you'll see here you can score 4.4 instead of 5.4 if you have only one lettered item that was in the acceptable column that you're missing. 
um, or you can earn a range of 0 to 3.6. Um, being unacceptable if you have two or more of the lettered items in the acceptable column that are incorrect or missing. So where it says two or more, if you are missing two, you would have a 3.6 as your score. If you are missing four or five of those components, anything more than two, then you would earn a zero for that section. So just wanted to give a brief overview of how the ISU rubric will be utilized. One more um, artifact that we're going to be taking a look at is the special education evidence chart for planning task one. So towards the end of the EdTPA handbook, you will see that there is an evidence chart for each of the tasks, and this will tell you what you are going to submit for task one. So you'll see that you have a part A where you submit the context for learning. Part B will be your lesson plans. Part C, your instructional materials. Part D are those assessment and data collection procedures. And then part E is your planning commentary. It gives you a list of all of the file types that you can use. And then it tells you that you have a minimum number and a maximum number of one that you will submit for each of these files. It also gives you information about the length. So as a reminder, context for learning can be no more than four pages. Lesson plans can be no more than four pages per lesson, but it will be submitted in one file. So for us, we're looking at a file of 20 pages. Then for your instructional materials, you can have up to five pages. There's no limit on your assessments, procedures, or data collection. And then your EdTPA commentary can be no more than 12 pages. You'll also see here your template has already defaulted at Arial 11 point and your margins are set. So just don't adjust those margins or default fonts. We will be accessing live text for you to submit each of your EdTPA tasks this semester. That is what is used in student teaching when you are submitting to Pearson. Um, for licensure, so we just want to make sure you have the opportunity to practice before it's high stakes. But as you see here where it's part A, B, C, D, and E, this is exactly how you will label each of the required pieces when you submit to live text. Finally, just wanted to discuss some uh, additional resources that might help you as you are digging deeper into EdTPA Task 1. The first is the Making Good Choices Guide, and this is like a lifesaver. It really goes through each of the prompts and discusses more in detail than the EdTPA Handbook. It's not used to be a um, replacement of the EdTPA handbook, but rather a support that will give you more um, examples or further explanation to help you understand those prompts. Another resource is the writing organizers. So on um, ReggieNet, under EdTPA documents, you will see for each task, there will be the notepad as your icon, and then all of the documents that you will need for each of the tasks will be listed there. There are writing organizers that really break down each prompt and give sentence starters to help ensure that you're answering all parts of the prompt. If writing is an area where you are, where you maybe don't feel very strong, this might be something that you would like to utilize. We also encourage you to utilize ReggieNet as there are a great number of resources for EdTPA that are listed there for you.